All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thanks again for joining me here at the Craft Beer Professionals Virtual Conference. My name is Sam Holloway. I'm with, should sit up straight here. I'm with craftingastrategy.com. Um, very happy to talk to you today about some of the amazing innovations that I've seen uh, occurring as craft breweries all over the world deal with the innovations and come up with new innovations during COVID to both stay alive um, and also to, in some cases, believe it or not, um, increase their performance, grow, get better. Um, none of us ever planned for anything like this, but uh, it's been really fun to sit in my chair um, and watch the industry and take notes. And what I'm, what I'm hoping to do today is to just share some of these amazing best practices with you, uh, in addition to encouraging you to take advantage of our free offer for all CBP members, all 10,500 plus members of Craft Beer Professionals to get access to our online community with over 175 content pieces, instructional videos, interactive case studies, uh, blogs, and a really, really uh, interesting and uh, something I'm proud of, a professional forum where brewing entrepreneurs across 20 countries now, we just added our 20th country, uh, help each other and ask and answer each other's questions. Um, so I hope after today, um, today's little sort of walk through COVID pivots and innovations that you'll ask me a lot of questions um, and that you'll uh, consider joining us because it's free for the rest of 2020. We want to see uh, as many small breweries as possible worldwide survive. And even after 2020 is over, it's only $100 a year. Uh, we think it's the best value in beer business education uh, available. And we're, we're excited to have you joining me here. Okay, so uh, in, a, in about 15 seconds, I am going to start sharing my screen. I'm looking at the chat right now. Uh, if you're watching and you have a question, I would love for you to put it in the chat. Uh, while I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat, but I am going to stop periodically throughout the presentation to just check and see what things are going on and see what questions you have. And then obviously at the end, uh, I'll shut the PowerPoint down and I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll go live with some questions. So uh, Andrew, it looks like we're ready. Thanks for that. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Here we go. Okay, away we go. Okay, so thanks again. Uh, again, I'm Sam Holloway. You can reach me in any one of these three ways. Email, I'm pretty responsive to, although I do have a day job as a professor at the University of Portland, um, but I'm usually pretty responsive within a day or two. So I thought I would begin with a, a brief just discussion of what crafting a strategy is, who its members are for folks that are maybe new to um, what we do and why we do it. Then I'm gonna give a, a brief uh, run through about how hard it is to run a craft brewery successfully no matter where you're at, United States, globally, wh wherever you're at. And I'm gonna use some data to just talk about the only constant in being a, a craft beer business entrepreneur is change. And uh, then we're gonna talk specifically about the changes that I've seen that have been really impressive uh, in COVID and, uh, and, and, and since, since uh, March of 2020. Okay, so briefly, who are we? And again, uh, remember if you, We've had over 100 CBP members already become members of Crafting a Strategy since we launched this promotion um, about a month ago. So I'm really excited about that. We want to get uh, as much help as we can. And, and the, the fundamental philosophy of Crafting a Strategy, and believe it or not, I'm a business professor, right? I, I teach uh, almost uh, two thirds of my time in MBA programs. Um, I've taught in MBA programs in Europe on strategy. Uh, I teach in the United States. I've written a textbook about strategy. And the thing that I always come back to is traditional business logic like scale and growth and uh, growing through scale. It doesn't work for small breweries. In fact, it's usually a recipe to send your brewery into bankruptcy. And so what crafting a strategy is, is me and my colleague, Mark Meckler, and other professors who help us for free because they love beer and they think you're an amazing entrepreneur. We know that small breweries are not simply smaller versions of large breweries. We can't just water down what we teach in a traditional MBA program and have it work for you. Small breweries must think and act differently. And that's really the impetus for why we started crafting a strategy six or seven years ago was we need to rewrite the rules in a way that makes sense 
for a craft brewery, a small craft brewery. And we're pretty excited about the growth. We've got hundreds of experienced brewery executives that use our website and log in each week. We send out a newsletter every Tuesday to over a thousand companies spread out across 20 countries. Um, the newsletter is free, but uh, we, we really believe in access. And so we charge just enough to keep the doors open, $99 a year. And uh, we're, we would love to have you consider joining for free for the rest of 2020 so we can help you and your brewery get through COVID. So what do I mean about change? So this is just some data um, pulled from ratebeer.com over the last, uh, since 2001. Um, and if we look at it, you know, you can see that uh, back in 2002, 12% uh, of breweries only made one kind of beer. Uh, breweries on average, craft breweries made six in the United States. And the average number of uh, products, you know, you could have a, a, a West Coast IPA and an Imperial IPA, et cetera, was 8.3. Fast forward to 2008, uh, the number of folks producing just one type of beer dropped, the average types increased, the average number of products increased. Fast forward to 2015, again, increase, increase, increase. But those of us that have been around for a while, we know that this isn't, the, this isn't necessarily working anymore. One thing about strategy that's so important is you have to do things different than your rivals. Now, most of the time in craft breweries, we don't talk about being rivals with each other, but at the end of the day, when you're competing for mind share among consumers, when you're competing for grocery store shelf space, and when you're competing for tap handles one, one on one, you need to be prepared to not just do the same thing, right? Back in 2002, just making ales and flavorful beer was enough. And any one of us that were operating back then who got in front of that craft beer avalanche in like 2006, seven and eight, we know that things are different now, the competition is fierce. And let me give you a little bit more data on this. So what are the implications of performance over time? And again, this is just to sort of frame the conversation of the craft beer industry, the only thing that's constant in its history is change. And that, that involves your strategy too. You have to be willing to change. So these three graphs, just real quickly. The first graph on the left talks about specialization and specialization, um, which is you know, measured as your, product, your craft beer product portfolio being different than the median product portfolio according to ratebeer.com. Uh, the number of products, right? Number of products as you produce more barrels is going down, uh, gen and that's a scale argument. But what I really want you to focus on here is the far right graph, distinctiveness. So this is a measure of the, uh, again, the product portfolio by metropolitan statistical area. So, you know, you might know that uh, Kansas City is both in Kansas and Missouri, but the MSA includes both of those states. So this is better data to look at the impact in a local market. We know that craft beer has gotten increasingly local over the years. And so if we look at distinctiveness, in 2008, being too, too different, too distinct um, was, was dangerous. It was probably better just to make a killer IPA and grow through scale. So the old business arguments worked back then. In 2012, it was tough to tell, but now what we're seeing, 2016 data, and this data is supported in the last three years, is being distinct, being different than the average. And I'm not talking about being different than AB InBev or different than Heineken. What I'm talking about is being different than the median product portfolio within your local MSA, your local metropolitan statistical area. So in a place like Portland, Oregon, where I live, you know, everybody still has to make enough IPA for those people that visit their tap rooms when tap rooms are open and allowed to be open. But you've got to do something a little bit different. You've always got to be pushing the envelope and being distinct from the median if you wanna have successful performance. So here we go. This is my talk for today. I call it the race for space. This article, for those of you that are in the kombucha space or subscribe to Symbiosis Journal, the journal of the uh, Kombucha Brewers Association International. Uh, this was just published a couple of weeks ago. These ideas, you can look for it there. And what I was really um, watching since about March 13th or so in the United States was that space, uh, space in our tap room, space on a plate, space on a table. This resource that we sort of maybe didn't think about very much because it was mostly a cost center, especially if we look at the rent that we pay per square foot for our tap rooms. Um, all of a sudden space became maybe the most strategically important variable for anybody that was trying to open their tap room. Uh, governments shut tap rooms. When they were allowed to reopen, you had to serve outside or you could only operate at maybe 50% capacity. And so the profitability calculus for a restaurant or a brew pub or a tap room, it completely flipped on its head. And so Professor Mark Meckler and I, we sat around and we watched this happen. We watched the uh, breweries in our membership struggle 
and come up with new ideas and new ways to think about space. And, and we did this, uh, and, and we did this sort of, we had the luxury as professors to take our time and do this. You know, I, I don't want to claim by any means that I have all the answers. Uh, and I also certainly don't want to, don't want to, uh, suggest that, that I, I can see the future any more clearly than any one of you brewing entrepreneurs. What I do have is the luxury of time. I don't have to get, get the, today's batch into cans in two weeks. I don't have to make payroll tomorrow, right? I'm a professor at heart. I have time to sit and watch and observe and think. And that's really what the race for space is. And I'm gonna take a pause here for a second just to see if we've got anything going on in the chat. And it doesn't look like it, <laughs> that's fine. Please submit your questions. I'm gonna go back from the current slide and keep going. Okay, so I wanna start with the close. So we spent about four months watching craft breweries make pivots, watching them move from tap rooms only sales to online mobile ordering and packaging to to go only sales to partially open outdoor spaces to partially open indoor spaces, uh, to closures again, like down in Melbourne, Australia, where they went back into lockdown. We have several members in Australia that are part of crafting a strategy that are still grip, grappling with the, the inability to open. And I'm sure a lot of you have gone through this. So here's the close. Here's what we learned. We learned four things, and I am gonna show these um, later in the presentation. First, don't think of your existing assets as solely useful in their original purpose. This is economies of scale thinking. This is pre-COVID thinking. This is sort of what we teach in business schools, which is if you can make more and more of fewer and fewer things, like a, a, a great IPA that you take nationwide, you know, maybe like all day IPA from founders, then that's good business. Well, in COVID, having huge assets dedicated to doing only one thing is expensive. It's hard. You can't repurpose them very easily. And what we noticed in COVID was if you could think creatively about how you use your assets, what we call architectural innovations, um, you're gonna have a better chance at survival. Number two, seek out ways to use your customer's personal spaces as marketing spaces. I know that might sound strange, and I don't claim to be a, a leading thinker in social media marketing, okay? We have a lot of people uh, in craft beer professionals that are good at that, like Julie Rhodes. Say, so, but I did notice some patterns, and I wanna share some of those patterns with you. Number three, change your mental approach to decision-making. This is not about scale and advantages and competition. It's really about survival. It's about making it to next April or May when maybe it'll be summertime in the Northern Hemisphere and things will get back to normal. And last, you know, just a plug for our community, find a group of like-minded entrepreneurs. You're already a member of Craft Beer Professionals. That's the first step. We think if you join our community for free again in 2020, that should be your next step. Okay, some examples. The easiest part about the race for space for most of us to imagine was repurposing physical space. Parking lots became beer gardens. We saw our members have empty fields next to their brewery become drive-in movie theaters where they blew up a screen, uh, had people come in and park on painted spots so they were socially safely distanced, order food online from, you know, to have a pizza delivered to your car along with some great beer. We saw uh, some of our members re-permit re and then re repurpose their production spaces. Every craft beer enthusiast loves to be around stainless steel, okay? If you can do it, why not sort of wall off or stack some kegs to separate off the dangerous parts of your operation from a couple of intimate tables seated close to your stainless steel so people can really feel, feel like they're part of the process and get close to that manufacturing process. The, there's great research out of marketing called the enchantment of technology and the technology of enchantment by a guy named Jell. You know, people like to be near the tanks. They like to be near the stuff. They like to meet the brewer. Um, and, and COVID has given us a chance to say, you know what? I'm not selling as much beer maybe as I did before and I'm selling nothing in kegs. Why don't I repurpose some of those spaces? And, you know, then there were some other ideas that I saw. Some of our members in San Diego, they had a, they repurposed the side of their brewery next to an empty field into a movie screen and they painted off markings in the grass and they got a new permit so they could extend their retail space. And they just had people bring in their own chairs and have beer delivered to them. Uh, by, by packing in and packing out your own chairs, that reduced the sanitation cost somewhat for the breweries that were choosing to do that. So I think the repurposing of physical space is the easiest to understand and probably the least interesting part of my presentation today because it's something that we're all doing. It's something we were forced to do. And, and for some of us, it's something we wanna keep doing 
because it's allowed more people access to our breweries than we had before when we were maybe a crowded tap room. Okay, repurposing online spaces. So again, I'm not claiming to be a social media or online expert, but I do do a lot of reading about the art of choosing. There's a professor at Columbia University Business School named Sheena Yengar who wrote a book called The Art of Choosing. And she says some pretty tough things about the craft beer industry. She didn't intend them this way, but she says, her research says, after about seven choices, many consumers opt out of choosing altogether. And we've actually seen um, Carlos Brito and some of the folks at AB InBev have mentioned that I think there's just too many choices in craft. And if you listen to that, you can get frustrated. It can be scary. But if you read her later work where she looked at why is this number seven the barrier, she actually found that there is a subset of consumers that actually love the challenge and the puzzle of choosing, and they can accept far more than seven choices. And so what she suggests is you should create missions or puzzles or experiences to allow those special group subsegment of the general population that love choosing to plan their choices into the future. Whether this is planning your choices as you walk down the grocery store beer aisle or planning your choices as you're part of an ale trail in your local community. And so then the question comes, well, how do I do that? And so I was really impressed with Bear Lip Brewing Company. Just checking my time here. Looks like we're on pretty good time. I was really impressed with crafting a strategy member, Bear Lip Brewing Company, who came up with this new mission or this actually, believe it or not, it's a hashtag called Send It, where they actually looked at, they, they said to themselves, whether consciously or subconsciously, our tap rooms closed by the government. People can't escape their homes anymore. They can't feel connected the way that they did, as in this picture of sitting in our tap room. But what if we could still find a way to make them connected? And so to do that, I'm going to show you some videos from their Instagram feed where they actually repurposed the kitchens, the backyards, the dining rooms of their customers to be video sets, to be movie sets. And they gave them a challenge of trying to slide a glass of their favorite beer down the bar, just like they would if they were at the Bear Lick Tap Room, record it and share it. And I thought it was a pretty interesting social media campaign. So here we go. So here's the first video. Okay, that's somebody's kitchen. Nice tile backsplash in the background. Send it over, slide it over. Cheers. Okay, pretty interesting way to engage someone that can't visit your tap room, would love to, maybe loves your beer, and really wants to still feel connected to your brewery. Okay, so then you see the comment there. So you saw our Bear Lick Brewing slide it over yesterday and now we want to see yours. Okay, here's the first one. So let's look again. Here's another customer set up their movie studio in their backyard, repurposed, tagged Bear Lick Brewing, and got to feel special again. Got to feel like they're part of the community and they shared it with their friends. Okay, what a wonderful way for us to ask our fans, ask our customers to repurpose their physical spaces, the spaces where they are allowed to drink, the place where they're enjoying our beer, even though our tap rooms are closed, into a place to help us feel connected, help us feel like we used to, help us get a little bit of normalcy. So I was really impressed with this. And it didn't actually stop with consumers. It actually involved competitors. So here's another crafting strategy member in Portland, Stormbreaker Brewing. They're getting into the act. They think it's pretty cool. And they've also got some pretty good social media skills. So all of a sudden now, they're part of it as a competitor, but really as a collaborator, uh, somebody that says, hey, this is pretty cool. This is going to make our customers feel good about Bear Lick Brewing. It's going to make them feel good about Stormbreaker Brewing. And it's maybe going to bring a little bit of normalcy back into their lives. So I thought the Send It campaign by Bear Lick Brewing was just a really innovative way to repurpose online spaces to give people a chance to feel that close emotional connection with your brand and with your beers and to do so in a safe, socially distant help folks. Okay, we've got a lot of people listening, not commenting, that's totally fine. It sounds like uh, one of my traditional MBA class. I do welcome a lot, of a lot of comments, especially during the Q&A. Okay, so I've given you an example of repurposing online spaces. And again, I don't, I don't uh, claim to be a social media expert, but I am a nerd that gets to spend time watching and observing cool things. And I thought the uh, Send It campaign of repurposing people's personal spaces into movie studios was a really, really innovative way 
for us to get through COVID together, not just together as entrepreneurs, but together with our consumers. The last, the last of the three categories we noticed was a repurposing of mental spaces. So I've had conversations with breweries in about 25 countries so far since I started studying craft breweries <clears throat> about 12 or 13 years ago. And here's the one thing, another consistent trend that I notice. We all got into this industry. We all turned our passion for homebrewing into a business to have fun. And fun is maybe the variable pre-COVID that was most lacking from our day-to-day -day operations of our businesses. <laughs> it gets, it's hard to run a business. It's hard to make sure we do enough right so that we can pay our employees. It's hard to try to get one or two days off a year as a business owner. Wouldn't it be great to be able to take a vacation again? Wouldn't it be great to be able to bring fun back into the business? And so in a very counterintuitive way, COVID-19 did this. And let me, let me give you just a scenario. I had several conversations with entrepreneurs that were terrified during March and April. Australia, Netherlands, Italy, even China, where craft is still in its infancy, but it is the world's largest beer market. These folks were terrified. And I said to them, we don't know if we're going to stay in business. We absolutely don't know what's going to happen. But maybe for the first time, we can try something we haven't tried in a long time that was sort of the whole reason for us to get into business, and that was to have fun. Is there anything, any resource you have or any idea that you've had that will allow you to have fun and bring joy back into your day-to-day -day operations that pre-COVID you just didn't have time for because things were going so well? Believe it or not, when the going gets tough, sometimes focusing on fun can produce new innovations. And so on the right of the screen here, I was really impressed with a bunch of breweries that had almost 100% draft sales, sales in cakes. And we all know that, especially in the United States and down in Melbourne, Australia, where there's still a lockdown, that, that's impossible right now. I, I saw Bart Watson tweeted, I think just a couple days ago, that keg sales are 1.9% of previous year keg sales. That's terrifying, right? And so uh, some brewers, they started saying to themselves, you know what? If I'm going to go out of business, I'm at least going to have fun doing it. I'm going to do things that I never would have thought of before. And so this brewer's farmer's market, I thought was a really interesting idea. Here's Old Town Brewing, a great brewery here in Portland, Oregon. They had a big parking lot next to them that they weren't really using to its maximum capacity. They also had a bunch of friends in the, in the industry that were hurt and bad. They were unable to sell through draft. They couldn't get access to cans. Um, they'd never used a mobile canner before because they didn't have to. And the mobile canners were completely locked up by their existing customers. And so these folks, and then they noticed that the farmer's market that used to be a really community center for them, it also went belly up and went under. It wasn't happening. So these brewers said, let's at least have some fun and move a little beer. Let's have socially distanced, our best friends, put up tents, rain or shine, and we'll have a drive through farmer's market style brewery. This got written up in the local newspaper. Other folks started having similar, um, similar brewer's markets. And, and this idea of, well, if choosing to have fun during a desperate time could produce a business model we never would have done before, I think what we noticed was maybe we need to get back to our roots, right? Maybe we need to get back to the reason that we got into this business in the first place. And that is, it's fun to sit around with your friends and drink beer, even if you make a bad batch, right? Which, I, which I've certainly done in one time I've homebrewed. It's, it was undrinkable, <laughs> even though I followed the rules to a T. I leave the beer making to other folks. I focus on keeping your business alive. But I think we need to think about strategy a little differently too. And this is what I really learned as a professor and as a person that studies the strategy of small breweries. I think if we use our imagination and focus on fun, new business models and new experiences are going to show themselves. Let me just give one example. If you moved from full taproom sales to online and to-go sales, and you spend a little bit extra time working on making that mobile ordering experience feel safe and normal and secure, that's actually brings fun and security back into your consumers. That kind of thinking, you know, I know, I know for a fact, mobile ordering of beer to-go sales was never on the radar of hundreds, maybe thousands of breweries prior to March of last year. But now that's actually brought in 
new customers that would have never visited your tap room that love the fact that they can get on their mobile phone, type in a few keys and have beer on their doorstep by the next morning at 11 a.m. That kind of stuff is exciting. And I think it's sort of a based on humor or based on the fact of, man, if the rules are so different than when I started and I can't do anything that I know I'm good at, maybe I can have some fun and meet some new customers and deliver beer to new drinking spaces um, in ways that I never intended before. So quick summary. Again, don't think of your existing assets as solely useful in their original purpose. Seek out ways to use your customers' personal spaces as marketing spaces. Change your mental approach to decision-making. And then I do encourage you to find a support group like CBP and others uh, and, and ask for help. Find those people, ask for help. And then here's just a brief testimonial about a company that we really helped go from the brink of closing about five or six years ago to a company now that is doing very well, looking to make their next move. Um, and uh, they were kind enough to present me with this testimonial and Steve was nice enough to let me share it with everyone. So <clears throat> what I wanna do now is open it up for questions. And I'm gonna stop my screen share, come back to the chat. And I hope we have some questions that can come from in the chat, but thank you very much for listening and I would love to answer questions. Okay, I guess we've got some uh, people that are a little bit uh, shy for answering questions. Let's see, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Andrew, feel free to ask a question if you have one. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we should all be prepared for as we move forward into uh, the winter time is, you know, what are we gonna do to use the innovations we've already developed to extend those and help us drive revenue? I think number one, is the pleasant surprise of mobile ordering, packaging in cans and moving forward. Now the can shortage that's happening worldwide right now is a bit of a concern. Uh, as I follow craft beer professionals um, and all the comments, there's a lot of people looking for 12 ounce cans. There's a lot of people whose orders are not being fulfilled right now because of the bargaining power leveraged on them by huge companies like Coca-Cola, um, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Heineken, et cetera. And, and it can be a scary time. You know, maybe you're going to have to think about moving into a different can type. Uh, maybe you're going to have to collaborate uh, with another brewery that maybe has, has some cans, do some collab rears, get those into cans. I just want you to know that um, we sort of anticipated this can shortage back in April. And in our newsletter that's free and available to anyone, it's always going to be free. We alerted our members of the impending can shortage about three months before Brewbound or any of the other national publications sort of came up with this with this issue. And so again, I think that's part of the value of being part of crafting a strategy is that we're constantly thinking on your behalf. Uh, we're constantly trying to see in the crystal ball to give you advice that's helpful and help give you a, a better chance at survival. And when things get back to normal, a better chance at really realizing your business's financial dreams in addition to the dreams that you're already realizing by providing great, great beer and great experiences and great cheer um, for people that love your brands. I'll wait about another 30 seconds to see if anybody has a question. Um, I'd love to answer them. If not, I know you're busy and I'd be happy to uh, take questions via email, um, you know, sam at craftingastrategy.com. Um, and uh, yeah, any questions? Okay, well, we're coming up on 30 minutes. I know that was a little bit shorter than maybe we wanted, but that's okay. I really appreciate those of you that watched and maybe and for any of you that are watching this recording later, please reach out to me, sam at craftingastrategy.com. I'd love to help you help your help yourselves, help your brewery be successful. And please don't forget to email 
Andrew Copeland to get the coupon code for all CBP members to get free access to crafting a strategy for the rest of 2020 so we can help you survive and then thrive after the pandemic. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.